Welcome to Solutions with Courtney Anderson. I am Courtney Anderson, your guide and host for this show. Thank you for joining me today. Today's show is part of our Joyful Art of Business series. And the Joyful Art of Business is the whole idea that we are human beings, And we should ideally ensure that whatever we do professionally, whether it's volunteer work or it's for pay, is something that we have an emotional, positive return on investment. So we're joyful because that's a positive return on our investment of our time and resources and our professional endeavors, which I refer to as business. And we are artistic. We are artists. We're not just sort of cogs and wheels. We're individuals with dreams and ideas and talents and many of these things hidden to ourselves. So what we're doing is we're practicing every single day to the best of our ability the joyful art of business. We're not going to work. We're not, oh, got to go another day, make a dollar. No, we are practicing the joyful art of So it's a good feeling and it's an artistic endeavor. We're doing it uniquely our way of business. And sometimes there's a little bit of negativity in this series. People say, ah, how are you going to be joyful? And, you know, I'm I'm in food service. Or how am I going to be joyful? I just have a really dull job. There are amazing, you know, internet videos where there'll be like, somebody who's like a crossing guard or someone who just stands in traffic or whatever. And they... And they make it their own. You know, they're dancing. They're making it fun. You can do anything if the circumstances permit, you know, if the, if the workplace permits. You can do anything with your own little special, unique flavor to it, with your own artistic talent, with your own interpretation. And I do mean anything. And, and people are doing that. And it lifts up the spirits of other people when they see you I don't care whether you're a crossing guard, you're um, a wait staff, you're a a physician, you you know, you're a flight um, attendant crew member. I don't care what you're doing. It lifts other people's emotions and energy when they see you being um, artistic, passionate, joyful, contented. And you can do this. It doesn't have to be drudgery. And, you know, there's not an argument that someone can make that I'm going to, at this point in my life, believe is, a credible argument that in just some jobs it's just awful and miserable and that's the way it is. And that's not accurate because there are people in almost every job, I'm going to argue in every job, who make it their own. And it doesn't matter how little you make or how much you make or how much pressure it is or how little pressure it is or how repetitious it is or if it's not repetitious, do something with it because you're special. And this is a challenging concept for me to convey sometimes because a lot of what I do is talk to people about the idea that we are replaceable, right? Even if we're the executive of a company, we can be replaced, and we often are. And because what I'm trying to do is get people to understand that other people's feelings and perspectives matter. And so it's difficult to balance that idea that we're we're all interchangeable to a certain degree with the idea that we that we have the ability to practice a special art. I don't actually, they're not to me in conflict. I'm always going to uniquely be me and do things the way I do it. Now, it doesn't mean that a, a employer or a client um, or a job isn't going to tell me to go. They have. And that's okay. And it doesn't mean that I'm not going to find a, a place in, in times in my life when I'm going to move on to something else. That's okay. And even though there's somebody else doing exactly what I used to do, maybe in my uniform, the same way I used to do it, it doesn't mean they're me. It doesn't mean that I'm so important that the world stops when I cease to be part of an organization. Of course not. That's silly. But it also means that while I'm doing something, I can give it my best and make it mine. Those things are, I believe, complementary. So I'm going to do my best within the framework of what I can control while I'm doing my professional endeavors, understanding that the larger framework, an organization, um, a business industry, is going to exist independent of whether or not I'm there or not. So to me, these are two wholly compatible concepts. So here we are, practicing joyful out of business. But what's our topic today? Our topic today is one that I think is, is really important for people who are very strict business strategists um, to explore. And it has to do with the idea of love. 
which some people would argue, well, that's not even anywhere near business. Uh, but I know it, it's absolutely, you know, inaccurate. Um, I, we've, doing it, we've done and we're doing other programs about people who just are incredibly passionate, people who love what they do maybe too much. That's a whole thing. Um, and it is love. There, there's love that people feel for the for their tasks and the work that they do and what they create. There's love that people feel amongst each other in a workplace. I've been a, a workplace expert, relationship expert, workplace relationship expert for a long time now. And a lot of what I deal with is negative, right? People are jealous, people can't get along, et cetera. But there's just as much positive. People love each other. People really care about each other. People emotionally invest in each other. There are places that... You know, when someone either retires or, goodness gracious, they're, you know, they pass away, people love them and are just mourning that. And, yeah, it was work, but does that mean it's less? Does that mean that, that, that those feelings are any less valid or real? No, of course not. So our, our show topic today is about this idea of love. And one of the things that's a cliche to some extent is this idea that, oh, I can't love anyone else um, I have, until I love myself. You know, I love myself first, and then I can love other people. And it's and it's out in all you know in all t- parts of society. It's in the entire self help movement, um, motivational uh, work. It's in a lot of positive psychology. It's in a lot of uh, management training, and a lot of the work that I do with executives. Right, like I'm going to enter the office with all of my emotional needs met, and I'm feeling great, and now I'm able to give to other people. And if I come to the office. Um, and I'm miserable, and I'm full of self-hatred and insecurity and pain, then more likely than not, (laughs) I'm going to not be able to um, give other people what I don't have, right? How am I going to be this sort of non-judgmental, patient, nurturing person when I'm inside just a, you know, in in turmoil and in pain and self um, I'm ta- attacking myself and thoughts that are telling me that I'm not worth anything and my business is a failure and, and, and everyone thinks I'm a fraud and all these types of negative things. So these things are all in one area in my mind or different slices of these different aspects that we talk about and highlight in different programs. But in this program, we actually are, our title is, I have to love myself before I can love anyone else. But, how do I love myself if no one else does or ever has? So the, the full title is, I have to love myself before I can love anyone else. But how do I love myself if no one else does or ever has? So this whole idea, again, that you know I can't give you something I don't have. So I can't give you patience if I'm not patient. I can't give you um, my caring if I don't care for myself. I can't love someone if I don't love myself. If I don't have it, I can't give it to you because I don't have it. And the whole, again, the idea that floats around out there is, oh, well, you love yourself and then you you can love other people. Well, okay, I, I actually agree with that. It's just another way of saying that I can't give you what I don't have. So if I'm patient, then I can give you some patience. If I'm impatient, I don't have any patience, so I'm not going to give you any. It's the same thing with love. If I don't have any love, I can't give you any. The challenge, though, that I think was not addressed maybe enough uh, in a lot of the programs that I work on is, okay, cool. You tell me I have to love myself, then I can give you some. Sounds simple enough. But for people who don't know what, exactly what love is, how do they love themselves or learn to love themselves or what does that mean? Especially when you're talking to somebody who has literally either never been loved by anyone or doesn't have anyone, you know, alive or in their lives right now that loves them. So it's difficult for you to expect people to be able to love themselves and turn around and give to other people if they don't know what what love is because no one's ever taught them or showed them and they've never experienced it. They're at a huge disadvantage. And so that's why we're doing this show because I, I haven't seen a lot of, uh, resources out there that you know directly address the problem. They just sort of tell you love yourself and love other people, sort of like you should be able to figure out you know how to love yourself. But the challenge is, no, not really. And people who actually have been loved, right, who know what this idea of love is, they've experienced it. You know, they had a a, a family member or uh, someone in their lives who gave them this thing called love, and then they experienced it. Now that they have experienced it, they're able to then replicate that process and give it to themselves, and then turn around and give it to other people. Um, but if the first part of this 
scenario sort of broken down and somebody's like, okay, I'm totally ready, I'm fired up and, I'm, you know, fill me with love, but they don't really know what it is because no one's ever done it, you know, um, and they don't they don't have a clear understanding of what it means and they're not able to, to really do the rest of the, the process. I can't fill myself with this thing if I'm not really sure what the thing is. What is this thing? And it might seem a bit silly, and sometimes I'll, I'll talk about this, and people get really kind of um, short with me, and they'll say, wow, oh, that's silly. Everyone know, has been loved. Well, that's absolutely not true. That is just absolutely, categorically not accurate. It is not an absolute that every single person on this planet right now that's an adult has been loved. That is just not true. Um, and some people say, what about the parents? And I say to you, um, and, and I'm currently and have done in the past um, – some of my volunteer work with uh, children in foster care or in uh, the child protective services system or the government takes them away from their, their family for their own safety. So I can tell you right now, I've worked enough of these cases and had my own you know, life experience that just because somebody biologically is a, gives birth or um, fathers, um, or at this point actually you could do both, right? Some, you can have somebody who's like an egg donor you know, it was their it was their, their genetic material. They were the sperm. It was their genetic material. But they don't even necessarily have to be the one that, you know, um, carry the child. Now we have egg donors and we have sperm donors and science is doing amazing things. But even beyond that, there are people who really are, you know, the, the biological parents. And they're the ones that carried, you know, the, the child. But they just never loved it. Sometimes the situation that the, that the people were under was such that they weren't, you know, prepared or able Often the, the, the parents were in a situation where they themselves never were loved. So this it's a, you know, it's the same it's the setup of the whole episode. I can't give you something if I don't have it. And I can't go figure out how to give it to myself if I don't know what it is and no one's ever showed it to me. And so when you read a lot of the literature in these um families of origin especially, where there's just generation after generation of dysfunction, it you, the reason you see generation after generation is multitude of reasons, right? There are lots of different reasons. There are a lot of different, um, you know, scientists and, 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 and social workers and, and psychologists and behaviorists and all these wonderful people working in these areas. But in general, sort of big picture for us um, non-professionals, it makes sense that if, you know, you're a person that has a child that your own parents never loved you and their parents never loved them, that nobody knows. And if it goes on for generation to generation, then who's there to fix that and kind of teach people, oh, this is what this thing called love is. Oh, oh, we had no clue. And so, you know, it's difficult to, you know, be angry with someone who can't give you something they don't possess. So the challenge for many adults in the workplace around the world is that they do want to have you know, positive relationships with everybody, you know, as much as they can, not everybody. You know, there's always been people you don't necessarily get along with that well. But in general, yeah, they'd like to be thought well of. And if they could have people who, that you know, that they felt very fondly towards and that people felt fondly toward them, it could be customers, it could be, you know, some places it's shareholders, it could be peers, it could be vendors, it could be staff. I mean, there, you know, like I said, we could sit here all day and share examples of people who really felt loved. And I have to say, and I, I don't know if this is the best anecdote, but some, it, it, it's, it's interesting to me. Um, so an executive who passed away very, you know, relatively recently, uh, Steve Jobs, right? Steve Jobs was the one of the co-founders, and then at the end of his life was back in the in the chief executive position at Apple. And now this is a kind of a, I thought it was a fascinating example of somebody who just was a business person. You know, it wasn't like he was a business person and he also, you know, was an actor, you know. And, and so there was some sort of reason why sort of the, the, you know, the public at large kind of knew who some business person is. Because typically you think business people and you think, okay, well, they're like doing boring business stuff. And people don't usually have, you know, feelings for, you know, businesses and business people. But I have to say that um, when Steve Jobs passed away, the outpouring of emotion that people felt. Of course, the overwhelming majority never knew him, but they felt like they lost a personal friend. A lot of people expressed feelings of, you know, affection and loss, grieving. People said people felt like, you know, some people felt that they loved this person, and it might be just because um, 
The first one is very successful, you know, but so was every other business person that, you know, makes that, that type of money. It might be a person had a great personality and was a very good at marketing and media events, and so people sort of got used to their, person, their personality. Um, it might be that they made some, made and marketed very well um, some great consumer products that people, that many people have in their own lives and recognize how it had impacted their lives. You know, and there were there were other people who had the opposite feeling and said, "Hey, this person was, you know, had a big personality and wasn't, you know, necessarily professional at all times." And but here's the point: how many business executives become ill and pass away, and it's like a lead story, you know, on news, and people are talking about it, and people are sad about it. I mean, it. How many people does that happen? And and my point is, it's an example that yeah, you could be a, just a business person. And really touch people's lives emotionally in a way. And that's why we're talking about this. And that's part of, in fact, the whole, you know, joyful art of business, right? That's what I'm talking about. Are you happy with what you're doing? And are you maximizing your return on investment, not just for profit or for shareholders? Are you changing people's lives, people who work with you, for the positive overall? Even your customers who've never met you, do they feel something for you? And it's rare when it happens, but when it does, it's just amazing to watch. So this whole thing is ideally, you know, and, and it's, a, it's a very deep human need, right? Love. Okay. My, but the reality is there are many, 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 many people, not just people who maybe had very dysfunctional families and were, you know, or, or were, uh, you know, um, abandoned his children or whatever, but there are people who are were raised in families, but there just there was nobody there that really knew this love practice. They didn't know how to do it. And so there's everything you read from people who are, you know, historically you sort of look at people who are from very um, meristocracy or even from royalty sometimes where there was no love, right? It was sort of like the, the, the person was a child and they went away and were raised somewhere else or went to boarding school. And, and they'll often say, even though they had, you know, immense resources, right? Um, they just never learned this love thing. And it might be, again, that the reason the person didn't give it to them is they themselves never got it. It doesn't matter. It's not, it's, it's not related to income. It's just, it's just that a, if you get a situation where people don't know what it is, they can't give it to somebody else. And if that's what's happened, then they're not going to be able to do it at work because they don't know what it is. So, you know, a definition, you know, for love that's universally accepted, I can't necessarily give one that won't invite you know, criticism, but I can generically say this. The idea of love is this idea of of non-judgmental safety, affection, and approval. And so how do you learn to do that for yourself if no one else has ever done it for you or, or no one is alive that, that loves you? Then you need to just sort of start with what are the, the, the components of it? Well, it's non-judgmental, right? That's why you always get this idea of unconditional love, the idea that you know, you could be an idiot or mess something up or embarrass someone or embarrass yourself, and I won't take away, I won't take away this, this support, my admiration, my appreciation. It's, it's going to be consistent. And that's a, so much of this idea of this love thing that's so powerful is the idea that I am inherently valuable as a person. And no matter what I do, I'll still be worthy of this positive appreciation and, and admiration and caring and attention and approval. So you just start looking at all those parts and then you start building your facsimile of love based on these different parts. So, you know, unconditional. You have to be unconditional with yourself. So you say to yourself, okay, self, yes, you messed up horribly <laughs> at work yesterday. In addition to that, you relate when you left. And so by the time you got home, you also messed up some things at the house and made other people mad. Okay. But unconditionally, I will never stop feeling this positive, caring, admiration, and approval for you. No matter what you mess up, no matter how dumb you are, no matter how stupid you are, no matter what, it's never going to go away. And I'm going to give it to you forever. Now, a lot of people who uh, don't necessarily come from families or friends or people who have done this in their lives find a lot of this in religion and spiritual practices, which is a wonderful place, right? It's where you go and there's this, again, this idea. It's never-ending. It's non-judgmental. The love is there. Um, it will never go away. And you're valuable. And you always will be valuable. And there's nothing you can ever, 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 ever do 
ever to make the this this the positive affection, admiration, caring, pride ever go away. That's where you start with this thing that you're going to give it to yourself. You're just going to give not un, totally, totally unconditional, non-judgmental to yourself. Yeah, you acknowledge that you did mess up or were late or you know made a mistake or were stupid or whatever, but that doesn't have anything to do with your inherent value. You're a good person. You're a valuable person. You have worth that will never, ever, ever, ever diminish. You approve of yourself. You are proud of yourself. Not every minute of every day, especially when you make mistakes and are stupid. <laughs> but overall, yes, you're proud of yourself. And it'll, you can never take that away. This sounds maybe sort of silly to people who don't get it, but look back at some of the other programs we've done about you know the 70,000 thoughts a day that people think on average, according to some... Uh, science research scientists and the number of those that are negative and the and the ramifications of telling yourself that you're a failure and and you don't deserve to live and you're a horrible person and and someone as stupid as you are is a fraud and I mean it takes a toll of course emotionally it takes a toll uh, in terms of your uh, psychological health it takes a toll on your your physical health your stress level you cannot give to somebody else what you don't have you must give yourself unconditional 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 approval always period done you must admire yourself and approve of yourself and say, good job. You must support yourself. So if you want to try something and you're scared, then you say to yourself, it's okay. I believe in you. You can do it. These are all things that ideally you should have gotten from some other person or caregiver. If you're an adult, though, and you're in a workplace and you didn't get it, this is a program about how can you give yourself the best facsimile of it so you can start to change things. There's not a person, I think, you know, and it's almost Freudian, right? But these are one of these sort of basic parts of being a human. The desire for attention, the desire for approval, the desire for affection, the desire to know that you inherently can never lose it. It can't be taken away from you. And you, you must give this. You have to start giving this to yourself. And all you, you just start telling yourself these things. You need to believe it. You can't say it to yourself and then you think to yourself, yeah, you have my unconditional approval, dummy. Okay, well, then no, it's not helpful. You know you're lying to yourself. You have to believe in it. You have to believe what? At a very core level, sometimes I tell myself, I have value. Now, it doesn't mean I have some super great value or some minimal value. It just means I have value. I have equal value to other humans. Other humans may be smarter, which they are. They may be more successful, which is, you know, up to people's definition, but of course they are. They may be more organized and they might procrastinate less. I can give you a laundry list, but the point is I have value. And it's, it's just sort of, it's almost like um, more of a scientific approach, right? You know, energy cannot be created or destroyed. It can just change forms. So if I have value, you can't create or destroy me. I can change forms, but I have value. It's inherent. I have it. I don't care how you wrap your head around it, if it's religious, if it's scientific, I don't care where it comes from, but you need to have some sort of core sense of yourself having some validity and, and, and value and hold on to that, no matter what happens, no matter what the world does, no matter what you may do in making bad choices at times and really disappoint yourself, but you have to believe this. You have inherent value, period, done. And then you have to surround it with this other sort of the, the garnishments. You're, I approve of myself. Why? Because I, why not? I support myself, so I'm going to take risks. And when I fail, I say to myself, you still have value. I'm very proud that you took that risk. It's all the things that ideally people get from other people. And ideally you got from the, from, you know, the womb, right? Really great, you know, parents, you know, the, the, the parents will sit there and maybe extended families and they'll talk to the baby while the baby's still in the womb and there's a lot of things people they read and there's a lot of things you can do from the beginning to really set the, you know, give somebody the best shot possible. And there are some people that get just so much of this, support, unconditional love, uh, approval, um, attention, that they are just primed, you know, for, for being the best they can be. There are still people that get all of that and they make not great choices and things will turn out well, but more likely than not, they've gotten advantages. And there are other people who didn't get any of this or get much of it, or maybe they had one person in their life, and maybe that person has passed away. But I'm just arguing that, that if we want to be able to get out there in our lives, and whether we're in a business person, you know, um, whether we're uh, 
somebody who's doing a lot of work with a with a volunteer group. It doesn't matter. The idea that 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 we touch other people's lives, other people emotionally invest in us and care about us, the fact that we can give to other people, you know, some of this, if not all of it, at times of of, of unconditional affection, of um, of approval, of attention. So much is just giving people attention because so many people say and they mean it. They feel invisible. You know, and when somebody says that, it's a painful, but it's a very, very important thing that they're sharing with you. And uh, many people feel invisible. And some people actually have so little interaction with other people and so little emotional um, uh, relationships and, 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 and investment in other people that it almost is. That people, and you see this more, more so globally in many different parts of the world, that people just live in isolation. Which is okay if you want to, and some of us have different personalities, but it's not healthy to feel that you're invisible. It's one thing to say, hey, I need my me time. I need to go be in my quiet space. Fine. It's another thing to feel like I'm invisible and literally there's not anyone that, that even is aware that I'm alive or has any. I don't have any impact on other people. And so, so many of the things in the programs that we do, whether it's about being of service, right? I, I shared a lot about how you need to be of service to other people, whether it's through some sort of formal program or volunteer program or just going on about your day and smiling at somebody, some stranger, you know, appropriately and greeting them. That may be the best thing that happened to them all day. And why not give somebody that? Let them know you see them. That's a powerful thing. So this whole thing is you got to work backwards. If you've not had someone love you or you or that you did and, and now they're not here so you don't have any sort of new way to, to get more external validation you have to really commit to a program for yourself and you've got to start taking these 70,000 thoughts a day and reprogramming them to really believe in yourself believe in what just that you have value it's kind of been a judgment of whether it's good judgment good value bad value whether you're you know but it's just that you have inherent value and then from there you need to start to build that you inherently will never ever ever take away or stop believing in yourself and caring about yourself. You really you really see yourself and parts of yourself, especially the parts that you struggle with, the parts that disappoint you, the parts that that you let yourself down about, and you begin to treat all of that with with kindness. In Buddhism they talk about loving kindness. Uh in different monotheistic um religions they they talk some you know so much and there's even sort of the the idea in some of these that God is love. It's powerful. Again, it doesn't matter whether it's a scientific concept. You cannot be created or destroyed. <laughs> you, you can only change form or it's a, a, a religious one or a spiritual one or a philosophical one. I don't care how it comes. I don't care if it's all of that. But you have to have a baseline that you understand that yes, you, now, exactly as you are, absolutely, unconditionally valued, approved, admired, appreciated, supported, nurtured. And you keep doing that. And you keep telling yourself this all the time. And eventually, ideally, you'll get to a point where more so than not, you treat yourself with kindness. You treat yourself with love. Yes, you make mistakes. Yes, you're going to make catastrophic mistakes you're going to screw things up you're going to fail that's just that's just life but you but you know because it's it, it's it's unconditional that that wasn't affect the, the kindness and the admiration you know it'll never go away and eventually the idea is if you fill up your own well with enough of this you will be able to go out and to work and whether it's your boss or your coworker, a customer a client a vendor a peer that you can begin to give them some kindness and that you can begin to to understand that you can separate somebody's actions and a consequence from their value. So just because somebody might have totally messed up and ruined something at work doesn't mean they're not equally valuable and an and, and awesome person that you can care for and have affection. It might mean that there's a negative consequence at the job. But remember, your value is is separate from whatever that job is. So even if I've worked jobs that went horribly wrong and I failed and was horrible, that doesn't make me less valuable or in some terms less loved. 
It might not have been the right job for me. It might not have been the right job for me at that time. That's okay. I'll just go do something else, and it'll all be okay because it'll never go away, the, the kindness, the support, the admiration. This is a lifelong commitment. And for some people, it might seem like way too much work, and you're in, okay. But if you don't ever begin to define in your own way what you mean by love and treat yourself with that consistently, then you're not going to ever be able to give it to anybody else, which means your work situation is not going to be anywhere near as optimum as it could because people don't invest in you because you're not able to invest in them. And and obviously, to be extremely clear, your rest of your life, family, friends, people who care about you, you're going to close that off because you're unable to give them even a modicum of something. Because you're in, in the inside, if you're empty, you can't get other people to love you and be in healthy relationships with you when you're not able to give them anything emotionally. So, like, I, you know, to me, this is one of the most important programs I've ever done. It's everything. You have to start with yourself, and I beg you to do it literally, like, right now. You have value, intrinsic, everlasting value. Thank you so much for joining me. Always come to CourtneyAnderson.com for more information.